Good evening, guys. Glad you're here. I noticed as Brother Noah was praying, I just happened to notice my heart rate was just up just a little bit. Uh, that's not from nervousness after all these years, but just excitement. Um, I love to do this, and I know Brother Noah does. You have been so faithful to come, and I, I, I want to just say this before we get into this lesson tonight, which is entitled, To Live As If. And I'll explain that to those of you who have not been reading the book uh, along with us. You are here because of the title of this book, Mastering Life Before It's Too Late. We're a little past halfway, and I don't know how you feel about having accomplished anything along the way in these last few weeks. I guess it would be very optimistic of me and Brother Noah to think that we've just revolutionized your life in about a month and change. But I do hope that God has been helping you with some things, and I want you to know, Preacher and I both have a sincere, sincere, sincere desire to impact your life and to help you find some kind of sanity in a crazy world because that's what, that's what it's really all about. We're, we're living in an insane, upside-down world, and we're having a struggle just to know how do I keep up with everything and keep my mind where it needs to be and be the Christian that I need to be. So we're going to get right into this, and let me sort of explain to you the topic, uh, live as if. There's a, a saying in the world of alcoholics. I hear those chuckling back there. We know who you are. In the world of alcoholics and drug addicts, uh, when they're not quite there, they're trying, they're struggling, and that's a difficult world to, to live with. And they say, fake it until you make it, uh, which is another way of saying live as if. We have been changing the titles of some of these, particularly for you guys who, who haven't read the book, so you can sort of get the idea of what these chapters are about. And so we have changed the title to this one tonight, To Walk by Faith, Not by Sight. Now that may sound like a biblical verse to you, because it is. There is our reality, and think about this as we start this, there is our reality, and there is then our response to that reality. And that's what this lesson is really about tonight. How do you respond to life? Do you respond by sight? Do you respond by faith? Do you walk your faith or do you just talk your faith? I talked to a missionary last night who's trying to raise $2 million. I saw several of you frown. That's a lot of money, isn't it? He has such great faith, and I told him it just moves me so much because we, we say we believe God can do anything. We say with God nothing is impossible. We quote the verses, but when the challenge gets big, it scares us to death, and we live sometimes like we don't really believe what we say we believe. So that's what this is about, talking about our response to life. You've heard of the power of positive thinking. So let me ask you this question tonight as we start. The power of positive thinking, don't have to answer, but... In your mind, if you had to say yes or no, is that a biblical concept, the power of positive thinking? I will just say to you, um, it's better than the power of negative thinking. Because a lot of Christians have that one down. You know, they've, and there is great power in negative thinking. Uh, there's nothing wrong with being positive. Amen? Um, positive thinking may not do all the things the Bible will do for you, but certainly it's, it's not a... It's not a bad thing. So positive thinking and faith. Positive thinking is helpful. Biblical faith is life-changing. See the difference? Faith is one of the keys to living a happy and a fruitful life. I see pins poised. I have no idea which, which of these is on your outline, so you guys will just have to keep up with me as I go flying through these. I'm going to get to... I'm going to give you a bunch of stuff here, and then I'm going to get to some very, very practical stuff, and I'm going to end with that tonight because that's what's really on my heart and what I think would help you more than anything. So if you say do you want to be happy, do you want to be fruitful, you can't do that without really biblical faith. Faith is the difference in confidence and confidence in God. If you ask me, Brother Bob, are you, would you be confident that you could raise $2 million? I would say I'd be very confident I cannot raise $2 million. But if the Lord spoke to me and said, I want you to raise $2 million, I would be very confident that God can do amazing things. That missionary said, we haven't been too long into this campaign to raise $2 million. We've already had a gift of $150,000 and another gift of 100 
$1,000. God reached down and tapped somebody on the shoulder and challenged them because that is something that he's trying to build faith through. Faith says God's got this. How many of you are going through the Genesis study? You've been reading about Joseph the last few days. And uh, it's just wonderful, rich scriptures. Uh, we, we read today the story where Joseph reveals himself to his brothers, or at least that was my reading for today. And he tells them, you, you think you did me dirty in putting me in the pit and selling me as a slave. But he said, you didn't really send me here. God sent me here to preserve your life and the life of thousands and thousands of other people. God did that. So that's, that's a faith thing. Joseph was living in faith and that the Lord did that. Faith says, I can do this or I can get through this because God is in it. So when we come to the end of this tonight, I'm going to ask you before we go home tonight, what's the greatest challenge right now in your life? So let me throw that out there early and let you be thinking about that a little bit. What's the greatest challenge right now in your life? What's the greatest challenge you've ever had in your life? It is faith that says, I can make it. I can get through this. I don't, I don't, have, to, I don't have to be a basket case to get through this. I don't have to be a nervous wreck getting through this. I can walk through this in calm because I have faith. And honestly, if there's any lesson that touches on what the real heart's desire, I think of most of us here tonight, if there's any lesson that does that, I think it's this one because that's what we're looking for. How can I look at all this chaos and craziness in my life and find peace and calm in the midst of those things? And we're going to talk about the details of some of those things. Faith says I can change. Now, I want to pause just a second. I've got so much to do. I'm rushing through, but I want, let me pause on this one. I can change personality, my habits. Do you know how many people are miserable and how many people don't accomplish what God wants them to accomplish because they excuse stuff in their life by saying, you ever heard anybody say, well, that's just the way I am. I've got a temper. I was, I, I've got some Irish blood in me. Just excuse that. I saw all the folks with Irish blood smile just now. Um, it's easy just to, or I've, I've got this problem in my life. I just can't overcome it. I can't fix it. It's just, it's just the way I am. Just a personality kind of thing. Let me, let me ask you this. If I ask you, are you an introvert or an extrovert? And I put the explanations of those up there. I'm not going to read them. I think you, you know. Our pastor is an extrovert. I love watching Brother Noah in a room full of people. Uh, he doesn't, if, if, I, if he's got a shy bone in his body, I can't tell it. Uh, he, he talks to folks comfortably. You can put him in a room full of strangers, and, and he'll make new friends. And it's, That's just his nature to do that. He likes that. He enjoys that. Look, you are looking at the world's biggest introvert standing here before you tonight. When I was a teenager, and I mean this literally, when I was a teenager, when company came to our house, I went to my room. I didn't want to sit in there and fellowship with these old people that my folks were talking to. They were probably 40, 35. I, I didn't want to get to know them. I didn't have many friends in school. Uh, I didn't invite a bunch of folks over for parties at my house. Um, I, I didn't get out much. Uh, I love to hunt and fish. I love to do that by myself. Spent a lot of time in the woods. I could be an axe murderer for uh, that description, doesn't it? I mean, uh, uh, that's the description of a psychopath, what I just gave you. Um, but there was a time when I got saved that God began to speak to my heart about some things. I not only didn't love people, I didn't like people. Now, what do you do if you don't like people and God calls you to preach? I heard a pastor say jokingly one time, I love everything about the ministry except the people. <laughs> uh, the ministry is sort of about people. But if, if you're not naturally a people person, what do you do if you feel like, and, and listen, it was a struggle for me when I felt like God was calling me to preach. I thought, Lord, call my brother. He makes Noah look shy. 
I mean, my brother, he's, he's a great, he sort of, you'd think he was quiet, but get him cranked up, man. He's, he's, a, he's the life of the party. He's a great extrovert. I kept, I've always felt like the Lord sort of missed it. He, he should have called him and, and, and left me alone. Uh, but he called me, and guess what he did in my life? He helped me, first of all, understand that you can learn to love people. And I can tell you honestly from the depths of my soul tonight, I love people. I love being around people. Now, I'm still an extrovert. I'm still not much good at it. I'm still basically very, very shy by nature. But I'm telling you, God can take you where you are, and God can help you change what needs to be changed and use what doesn't need to be changed. And it's, a, it's such an important principle. And, and all that's wrapped up in, in this business of our, of our faith. So what is this thing? Live as if. Romans 6, 11 says, reckon yourselves to be dead. Talking about sin. Now reckon is a good West Virginia word. East Tennessee word. Well, uh, reckon so. Uh, reckon yourself. What does reckon mean? Reckon means to live, that verse would mean to live as if you have no interest in sin or no interest in the things of this world. Now, if I ask you and you had to be honest, do you have any interest in sin sometimes? Do you have any interest in the things of this world sometimes? All of us, if we'd be honest, because we have a flesh nature, would have to say yes. More interest than I would like to have a lot of times in those things. But Paul said, when you get saved and the Holy Spirit comes into you and you are filled with the Spirit, you need to live as if. None of that interests you. Reckon yourselves to be dead to those things. The Bible says of Abraham, he believed God not having received the promise, but he lived as if he had received the promise. He never did receive the promise, but he lived as if he had because he believed God. It's the faith thing again. So let's move on and talk a little bit how this ties in with, with what we call attitude. I love this uh, passage of Scripture. Proverbs 23, uh, 7 says, As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. So let that verse sink in. That could be the key verse, the theme verse for this lesson tonight. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. How many of you know that's true? Attitude is a choice. So look at me. Let me tell you something. It's going to be hard. It's going to be tough. If you have a bad attitude, it is not your wife's fault. If you have a bad attitude, it is not your boss's fault. If you have a bad attitude, it is certainly not your pastor's fault. If you have a bad attitude, it's because you choose to have a bad attitude. And there's some folks, it seems like that's, the, that's their default setting. They just go through life with a chip on their shoulder. They go through life just sensitive about everything. We live in a world of crazy sensitive people with bad attitudes. So th this life-altering alter truth from that verse of Scripture, I believe this is really two. We have no control over what brings us. All we can control is our response to it. So here's how that works. Every day of our life, without fail, over and over and over and over, little things and big things, stuff happens. And when it does, we choose how we're going to respond to that. When somebody cuts you off in traffic, by the way, can I stop and say, and I'm going to be honest with you, there are days that nothing bothers me. There are days I'm flying high. There are days I just get out of bed feeling good. Maybe I slept better. I don't know. I just... I just this is just a good day, and nothing's going to ruin my good day. And there are days that I'm just grumpy. I'm, I'm, I'm just being honest with you. There are days, and I, I don't know why. It's not because I didn't read my Bible, not because I didn't pray, not because the preacher's sermon wasn't good Sunday. It just, I, I'm, just, I'm just grumpy. And it seems like everything just sort of bugs me. And it seems like i got a short fuse. And any little thing, something that would not norm, normally bug me at all, will just get me way up, up more upset than I ought to be about that little thing. But I want you to know, for all of us, that's our choice. That's our choice. That's not anybody else's fault but ours. We, we can control our response to life. That's what the at, that if, live as if thing is about. The response is the difference between a happy life 
and a miserable life. I wonder how many folks here, if I ask you tonight, how many of you would say, don't, don't raise your hand, put your poker face on. If I ask you, how many of you guys would say, man, I'm really happy. I'm a really, right now, I am really, really happy in life. Life's good. I feel good about it. I'm happy. And I wonder how many would have to say, you know what? There's a lot of folks that probably think I'm happy. But the truth is, I'm under a lot of stuff that's dragging me down. And deep down inside, you'd be amazed how many people in this room even tonight are struggling big time with depression and discouragement. And if you ask them why, some of them would tell you, I don't really know why. Because i got a good life. Honestly, things are, are not that bad. I know there's lots of folks that have it way worse than I do. But I'm just sort of struggling. I, I don't live on top of the mountain. I, I just live my life in the valley. Life's hard, and I'm struggling right now. And, and, and life is hard. Um, but our response to life is determined whether we're happy or not. Doing the right thing, having the right heart is hard. It is much more fun to wallow in misery. Now, you know that's true, don't you? You're looking at me, but you know that's true. It's just easier to grump and gripe and feel sorry for yourself when, when bad things happen. And uh, we'll, we'll look at a list of bad things here in just a little bit. Attitudes spring from emotions. How many of you look at me? I am going to ask you to, if you'll be honest with this. Will you be honest? Will you help me? We can't. I notice Noah struggles. I think if, if you ask folks, how many of you would like to have a million dollars? Raise your hand. Half the folks would raise their hand. Right? See, when I don't want you to, you're good at it. Uh, how many of you would say, I am by nature sort of high strung? My hand is way up there, way up there. Okay, there are six of us here. There are six of us here who are high strung. The rest of you guys, are you got it going on, man. You are what we want to be. We just dream about just being cooler and calmer and more collected. Um, here's what I've learned. There are some folks who are just by nature more emotional than other people. I mentioned my brother a while ago. My brother is the calmest. He is a, uh, he's my hero in that regard. Now, he may watch this, but so I'll say good things about him. But um, I know of one time in his life, I won't tell you that story, but one time in his life that we still tease him about when he sort of lost it. But other than that one time, he just doesn't get upset. Nothing bothers him. He just cool, calm, collected, whatever comes. I mean, he's the guy you want to have there in an emergency. He's that kind of guy. And he, he just gonna, he's all the, the same all the time. Man, I envy people like that. Um, when I panic, I want everybody around me to panic with me. Let's, hey, let's, if we're going to panic, let's make it good, you know. So, so we all struggle with this thing of emotions. They're normal. They're part of being a human being. Christians have normal emotional responses, good and bad, just like everybody else. Now, I'm going to show you something here that's worth the price of admission. It's worth you coming tonight. I'm going to show you a couple of verses of Scripture that may surprise you a little bit. Jesus had the same emotions that we do. The Bible says Jesus wept. And if you look at those verses, it may surprise you if you've never read those to know that the man who said, and we all know the verse in John 14, let not your hearts be troubled, that that man, Jesus, was troubled. You can look it up in your Bible. John 13, 21 says Jesus was troubled in spirit. When Jesus prayed in the garden, the Bible said he prayed being in anguish. Uh, he stood at the grave of Lazarus, as you know, and, and wept, tears dropping off of his face. When in just a few minutes, he's going to raise Lazarus from the dead. And I don't have time to go into why Jesus wept. It's a great passage of Scripture. But I want you to know, Noah mentioned the verse Sunday, I think. Jesus was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. Jesus had all the normal feelings that you and I have. The Bible says when he saw the money changers in the temple, 
that it angered him. If you could have, if you could have put, a, put a medical instrument on Jesus, if you could have wrapped a blood pressure cuff around his arm right at that moment, you would have discovered that Jesus' blood pressure was up because he saw something that just, we like it better if we call it righteous indignation, that just caused his righteous indignation to rise and he saw his heavenly father being blasphemed by these, these money changers and, and he said, I'm going to do something about that. But the Bible says he was angry in that moment. So we all have those normal human emotions. Even Jesus had those. So here's what Jesus would say to us and what he was saying, I think, in John 14. We have to learn to control those emotions, not let them control us. Don't let your feelings determine your response, but let your faith determine your response. And that really leads us to the crux of this lesson and the live as if thought, the walk by faith and not by sight. The deeper your faith, the easier it is to respond in the right way to the things that life brings us, good things and bad things, the struggles in life, the the greatest challenge in your life that I'm about to ask you about. The deeper your faith the more able you are to have peace in those times of storms. So, as I wrap this up, and I'm going to take a few minutes to do this, not many minutes, but a few minutes to do this, Uh, I want to to ask you, and then I want to walk you through life in the real world for just a few minutes and get you to think through this with me. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. We can get old and grumpy, or we can get old and be pleasant and productive, as Brother Morgan says, pleasant and productive. I am still trying to figure out when old starts. Uh, I read a, a journal that I've kept for many years, and I talked about a day that was very strenuous that I'd spent in the mountains with my boys, and I said, uh, and this old man was tired when the day was over. And my wife said, when was that written? And we did the math. Uh, I thought I was getting older then. Uh, I was not. I don't know when old age begins, but here's what, here's what I believe, and I may be wrong. Uh, I've said this. I've said this in my Sunday school class. I think most grumpy old people were probably grumpy young people. <laughs> now, I will tell you, uh, where's Brother Richard? Richard, where are you? Back there. Uh, Brother Richard has had three knee surgeries, I think, already. He's about to get to having another one. As we get older, stuff starts to break and break down. And... You need to learn how to handle pain when you're young because you're not going to have less of it as you get older. You're going to wake up as the older you get, the more you're going to wake up with things that just don't hurt and don't do right. And and it's just a part of life. But I want to tell you, as as a former pastor, some of the sweetest and kindest and most spiritual people that I have ever pastored have been older people who were a blessing to me and a blessing in my life. And as Brenda and I age, starting a while back, we have watched other people and we have said, Lord, help us not to be that way when we get old. Always grumping, always pining, never happy about anything, wanting to turn back the clock 40 years. And if we could just do that, life would be peachy. We have said, Lord, help us to adjust to the world that we're going to live in because the world ain't going to change for us. Help us to learn to be happy in the world that you've called us to minister in because if you're miserable, you can't be what God wants you to be. You can't be the blessing that God wants you to be because nobody wants to be around you. If you. If you've got the power of negative thinking down and all you ever do is whine and complain... Bo and I were teasing a while ago. We asked each other, how, how you doing? And he said, well, I always say I'm fine. I said, that's good because nobody cares. 
They're just saying that how you doing. They don't really, they don't really want to know your list, but boy, some folks you ask them how you're doing, they will tell you. They got it written down and memorized. They will tell you every little ache and pain they've ever had since they were 35 years old. They'll begin, and, and folks just sort of don't ever ask you how you are after they ask you once. And, and Brenda and I are just praying, Lord, please help us keep enough of a clear mind not to be that old grumpy person as we get older. We can lose a loved one, maybe a husband or a wife, maybe a child, and you can keep on living, or you can, you can crawl in a hole and die yourself long before you really die. And I've seen folks do both. I can't imagine what it would be like to lose a spouse. My wife's parents were married for 70-some years. I forget how many some, but over 70 years. And one of the things that when Brenda's dad would try to celebrate an anniversary with her mom who had dementia, and she would say, how long have we been married? And he would say, 72 years or whatever it was at the time. 72 years? Well, how old am I? She would say. And she was always amazed to discover that she was in her 90s because in her mind she wasn't that old. But when you've been married to somebody for 70 years or 40 years and the Lord takes that person to heaven and leaves you here, I'm not going to stand here and tell you, well, just no big deal, get through that. It is a huge deal. And I'm talking to several folks here tonight, and we've got tons of folks in our church. This is not theory to you. It's theory to me. We got men and women here tonight that you've walked that road. But what is faith for if not for those times when life throws you a curve, when it doesn't go the way you hoped and prayed that it would go? All of us, if we love our spouses, would love to die in the same hospital room holding hands and go at the same moment to meet Jesus. That seldom ever happens. That's the story that makes the newspaper once in a while. And so when we're left behind, what are we going to do? You, you can crawl in that hole and just be miserable, or you can say, uh, I'm, I'm going to go on. I'm going to honor my spouse, and I'm going to be a happy, productive Christian until the Lord takes me home. We can allow challenging people. Do you, do you guys know any challenging people? Do you have any challenging? Now, I'm trying to be kind. When I, I really wrestled with how to describe these folks, and I'm being very kind when I say challenging people. Any of you have a mother-in-law that's... Nah. <laughs> Any of you have a brother or a sister, a member of your own family, that's just nuts, uh, crazy, out there? Uh, all of us, all of us, if we had time. <laughs> Tim said he does. He can relate to the, he can relate to the brother. We, amen, we, got, we, we feel your pain, Tim. We, we feel your pain. Um, I'm not going to be specific since this is being recorded, but we have a family member right now <laughs> that's just driving us cuckoo. And I'll tell you why because it breaks our heart. Um, and I'm going to talk more about this in just a second on another one of these, but listen, when, when you've got somebody in your life that's just making your life more difficult because of their insanity or lack of character or whatever, it's hard. And if you're not careful, that can consume you. That can become your identity. That can, that can become the focal point of your life. And, and, and somebody else who doesn't have joy will be, just be sucking all the joy out of your life and out of your family. And we're not meant to live that way. We can care for an aging or sick loved one and mourn over what we lost because we have to do that. Or we can realize that we have an opportunity to bring joy to somebody's life as that life ends. And this is not theory for me. This is reality. We've been through this with Brenda's parents, as some of you know, and 
less than a week ago, I went up to West Virginia and picked up my mom, who's at our house uh, tonight. My brother, because he lives in Beckley, West Virginia, where my mom and dad have lived all their life, basically, in the last many decades. So when they started getting sick, my brother has taken on the lion's share of taking care of mom and dad and checking on them. And they, they had healthy lives for most until they were well up in their 80s. My dad died three years ago at 88. My mom sort of went into shock when dad died. And uh, my brother has had and has done a wonderful job of taking care of my mom, going over. She was able to stay at home. He's been over and checked on her about every day, made sure she's got everything she needs. And they've loved on her. And Brenda and I, since we live away, we've visited when we can and done the best we can. But mom, maybe a month ago, just got to the place that she could not be at home by herself anymore. Now I'm looking around. If we had time, some of you could come and tell me your story about this. You've lived it. And so my brother took her home, and he's had her for several weeks at his house. And a few days ago, I went up to West Virginia and picked Mom up and brought her down here, and we'll have her for a while, and he'll have her for a while. Um, here's what you learn if you're taking care of your parents. Your life revolves around that. Uh, if it's the way it normally is, you'll get to where you have very little freedom. You can't go like you used to. Vacation is not really an option. You can't take a week-long trip because there's nobody that wants to come to your house and help your mother with her bathroom needs. And so you will be there. And I know some of you, I just talked to some who are living this now with us. If you're not careful, you can get to feeling like that's not fair. The truth is, I think it's the fairest thing in the world. Um, my mama put her life on hold to take care of me, and I wasn't all that easy. And I had two brothers who were tougher than me to take care of. And she put up with us and put up with all kinds of things. It is our great privilege now. Is it fun? No. Is it hard? Yes. But... You can live through that and live your faith and, and be, be a blessing rather than to worry about not being able to do what you need to do and would like to do and having the fun you, you want to have and planned in retirement and all. You can get bitter about that. Or you can say, this is a chance for me, one little chance probably for just a little while to be a blessing to the people that brought us into the world. And let me say this just for... So no guilt goes anywhere with this thought. Does it reach the point sometimes when you can no longer do that? Absolutely, yes. The cruelest thing I think parents ever do is make their kids promise that no matter what happens, you will never put me in a nursing home or you'll never put me in assisted living. That, that's the cruelest thing in the world. Brenda and I are going to make our own reservations while we're in good mind. And we're going to tell our kids, when we go looney tune on you and, and you can't take care of us anymore and we're driving you absolutely nuts, take us over there. We've already, we've already picked out the place and made reservations. Take us over there and we want you to know we're cool with that. We may not be then, but we are now. I know some of you can relate to that one. I know some of you can relate to this one. We can have a prodigal child or grandchild and worry ourselves sick over that child or grandchild. Or we can trust that child to Jesus. Do all you can. Pray for them. But you cannot do what only Jesus can do. You can't make decisions for somebody else. You can't. It's a heartbreaking thing. We have, we have more than one grandchild that is not where they wish they were, uh, either with the Lord or in life. It is a heartbreaking thing. When these little guys that you, you saw come up from the time that they were babies and they were raised in church, they were raised in pastor's homes. And to look at our grandchildren who are not even going to church on Sunday, who are that far distance from Jesus, who have, who have, he is far from their first priority in life. It is a heartbreaking thing. And we pray for them all the time, and we care about them. But there's only so much you can do in that circumstance. And I'll end with this one. We can hear about Korea, Russia, China, 
the crazy woke movement, earthquakes, floods. I started, and I wish I had, I, I started just this week to start writing down all the scary things that we see every morning on the morning news. When we have our coffee, that's what we see every morning. We watch the first five minutes of CBS News before they go to the rock stars and the Grammys. You get five minutes of real news. We watch that every morning as we have our morning coffee to see what happened in the world while we slept. It is never good. Um, one leading politician I saw a quote today said, we have never been closer to World War III than we are now. We live on a powder keg with multiple fuses that any crazy person could light at any moment, and life as we know it would come to an end. It would never be the same again. Now, am I saying that to scare you? No. I'm saying that for the exact opposite reason, because I... I hear some of you guys talk and others. There are a lot of people who are literally, I'm talking about Christian people, who are literally scared to death and worried to death about all that. So I want to leave you with some good news, and then Brother Noah's going to come, and we'll, we'll pray about all this stuff together tonight. John 16.3 says, In the world ye shall have tribulation, problems, struggles, difficulties, but be of good cheer. Now Jesus said that. We've been studying. We studied this Sunday in our, in our literature. Uh, evil men and seducers will wax worse and worse. In the end times, there will be perilous days. There will be all kinds of horrible things going on. But we're to just faithfully serve the Lord in that and leave that with Him. One of these days, guys, and this is the, this is the thing of live as if. One of these days, we're not going to have to put up with any of this anymore. I see so many folks, and I could get in trouble here, and I won't go very deep in trouble. There are so many folks who are so concerned about America and just determined that we're, we're going to find a way to fix all these problems that we see in our country. I won't be honest with you. For a long time now, I have shifted my focus from that view, and I have lifted my eyes to a higher plane where my citizenship is. The Bible says we're citizens of heaven. All is well where we're going to go. There are no problems there. There's no craziness there. All is well. And we're going to spend eternity there, not here. But we got all of our focus and our very existence and our happiness is centered on this old world that's one day going to be burned up and consumed and remade into a new heaven and a new earth. Let's shift our focus. Don't lose your joy trying to fix something that's so broken that it won't ever be fixed. It's just going to get worse. Rest in your faith, not in the sight, not what you look at on the news. And I'll close with this one. Scott quoted this in Sunday School Sunday, and I thought, that's going to be my new theme verse, Luke 21, 28. And when you see these things come to pass, look up and lift up your heads. Now, look at that list in Luke 21 and Matthew 24, all those things that I put up there and many more, earthquakes and famines and pestilences and wars. And Jesus mentioned all those things. He said those are the beginning of SARS. But when you see those things happen... He didn't say, you're going to be really depressed. You're going to be really discouraged. He said, when you see those things happen, lift up your head because you know your redemption draws nigh. So I stand, this introverted shy preacher here tonight stands before you saying, the more bad news I see, the more excited I get, and the more my faith is bolstered, not not damaged, not broken, not hurt, the more my faith grows because I've been preaching now for 50 years, close to it, and I've preached about the second coming of Jesus and I've explained the chart that Scott explained our Sunday school class Sunday about the rapture and when it all happens and all that good stuff that we all have memorized. But I'm more hopeful tonight, guys, as I stand before you, I'm more realistically hopeful that we might be, some of us sitting here tonight might be the generation that is alive when Jesus comes back for his bride. How cool 
would that be? To just be taken out of this world and taken to that next world. I, that's where my hope, is, my hope is. That's where my trust is. That's, that's faith. That's what faith is. It's not this. It's not sight. It's not what all the, the stuff that we see. It's living as if we really believe that. That there really is a God. There really is a heaven. And one day we're going to be there forever and ever and ever. That's pretty cool stuff. And I hope you'll be encouraged with that tonight. Live as if all of that's a reality because it is. Let me have a quick prayer with you and Noah's going to come and we'll take some prayer requests. Lord, I do pray tonight that you'll just encourage these guys. I, I think it'd be scary if we knew what somebody came into this room carrying the burden that's on somebody's heart tonight. Maybe scary things. I know there's folks here that are struggling. That's why they're here. So, Lord, I pray you'll use this thought tonight, this chapter tonight, Brother Morgan's book. I pray you will use this just to encourage our hearts and lift us up. Thank you, Lord, that we can trust in you, that you're trustworthy, that what you say you will do, you will always do. And, Lord, we do look forward to that day when you come for your saints. And we put all of this behind us. And even if we have to wait till we die, there will be a day when the angels come and get us that this is just going to be history. And we'll never deal with it again. So Lord, help us to live as if. Help us to live happy, joyful, to be at peace, surrounded by all kinds of scary things, but to have the peace of God that passes all understanding. We pray it in Jesus' name. And amen.